welcome to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show, built by Par Lumber. When it comes to big or small projects around the home, Tony and Corey have got the know-how and the answers to make your life just a bit easier. Here they are, your Weekend Warriors, Tony and Corey. Hey, welcome to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show built by Par Lumber. I'm Corey Valdez. And I'm Tony Cookston. Thanks for tuning in with us today. We've got another great show lined up for you. You know, Tony, summer is almost over. I agree. I, we've got a few weeks left to go yet. It's, uh, you know, it's still decent and warm outside. We've still got some sun. It's not raining or getting cold. But uh, we definitely are running out of time to accomplish projects that uh, should be done now before it's too late. Absolutely. And there are a lot of things around my house. And I know there's a lot of things around your house that you want to get done. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to we're going to give everyone a list of projects and probably talk about a, l- a little bit, I'm sure, uh, of things that you can do around your house to before it snows, yeah. or before the winter comes. It's uh, it's kind of an un- some of it is a kind of an unconventional list. Some things that are maybe things that you wouldn't do every year. Some th- of the things that we're going to talk about are things that you maybe haven't done, have wanted to do, but haven't taken the time to do it. So this will be a an inspirational show for some of the things that maybe would be a good da- idea to get done now before you know you're into another winter season and uh, and not waiting until next summer to do it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, and there are other things you know along this line that we're not going to talk about because we do a show every year that we call Fall Home Maintenance. You know, we like to talk about all the things that you need to do around your home to get prepared for winter, you know, winterizing this or, or, you know, cleaning that out. We're not going to talk about that stuff because that's fall. It's not quite fall yet. Yeah, here's are a, still summer yeah. project. Here's a prime example. We could say to you while the sun is out and while it's not cold and rainy, you should clean your gutters. But the fact is, if you clean your gutters now and then, at the end of September, all of the leaves start to fall off the tree. You're going to have to clean your gutters again. So if you have cleaned your gutters last fall after the after the leaves fall off of the trees, then we'll wait until this coming fall after the leaves have fallen off. So you're not having to go up there and do it over and over. We could obviously say go clean your gutters, but I think it's premature. And so this well, is a you primary know what? example. In my opinion, it's never premature to be cleaning out your gutters. I clean my gutters out probably once a month, to be honest. Because I tell you what, when it rains and just the slightest pile of needles in my gutters causes them to overflow like a waterfall. It's crazy. Did you so feel, feel like there might be another problem there? No, no. It's just needles. <laughs> Pine needles. Well, I, I, mean, I, I suppose I could get a, uh, you know, eight inch wide gutter up there with some four inch PVC downpipes or something. But I mean, bar that. Well, it sounds like I wish I had your amount of free time because with all of the things that I want to get done, cleaning the gutters twice in a season is probably not on my priority list. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't even have trees that overhang my roof. But when it starts raining and I see the waterfall, I'm out there. I'm grabbing my ladder. I'm running outside. I, and I know all the spots around my house that I have to get up and clean right away because it's almost like it all fills up at once. The gut, you know, only when it rains really hard. Yeah. I'll, I'll say that. And they all rush down to the ends where they go down to the downspouts and they're just clogged. I, well, gotta, I just got to reach usually just one handful, pull it out, and then they all drain. I Crazy. don't like cleaning my gutters in the rain. And I hate it. I end up doing it every year. In the rain? In the, because we live in Oregon. Because we live in the Pacific Northwest. Well, if I thought about it, I would do it when it was dry. I'm definitely not going to do it before the leaves fall off the trees, though. That's not what's happening for me. <laughs> so that's me in a nutshell. All right. But we definitely have a long list of things that uh, you should be thinking about now before the rain and the cold comes. So uh, those will be things we're talking about. These are still summer projects, folks. Summer projects, and uh, and some of them are things that maybe aren't on your, uh, you know, priority list, but some of them are, and um, and and so they will be for some other people. Well, for instance, here's a good one because uh, let's just get the, the list started sure. because at your house, this is a project I know for a fact that you need to get done, and that's cleaning and staining uh, your deck, the deck on your house is a wrap around porch essentially it's not really your your standard 
you know, back deck with cedar. It's you have a wraparound porch, covered porch, and that is decked with tiger wood. Is that what that's right? What it is? Yep, tiger wood. And it's seen some weather in weird patterns. Yeah, up close to the house, it doesn't see much at all. Right, but out towards the edges, it does. And you were saying, I think a couple weeks ago, maybe on this show, that you needed to strip, clean, and stain that deck. That's right. I actually have stained it every year before. Every time I've stained it, I've stained it with penifin. Penifin doesn't actually have to be stripped off. Uh, you can simply clean it and re-add penifin because it's a penetrating oil stain. Versus? Versus something that... Uh, creates a solid surface on the outside of your deck. Like, um, I mean, I don't drop names necessarily, but Olympic makes a solid stain. Um, Thompson's water seal makes a solid stain. Something that... Like an acrylic, something that sits on the surface some, rather than right, penetrating it. Right, and then at, when it starts to fail, you know that because it starts to chip and peel off that finish. And then you have to go through and strip all of that off to get all of that off in order to get something to lay back down. Because if you lay it over top of it, then it's just going to peel off again. Yeah, yeah, and it's not protecting your deck for sure. So I I prefer a penetrating oil stain like Penifin or Super Deck or Sunfrog. Um, these are all products that are really good for wood. They soak in the oil, soaks in, and protects the wood from the inside out. And that's the way I like it. Plus, it makes it beautiful. Um, however, this is what I've learned. Um, deck detergent or deck detergent works really good. But honestly, I get the very best result when I use a stripping type agent, like a, like a Penifin two-step stripper, for example. Hmm. Um, I could just clean it, but when I strip it, I feel like I get a really, really good finish on the deck. So um, that's what I like to do. That's the product that I use when I'm cleaning my deck. Do you, have you ever pressure washed it? Oh, no, I don't use a pressure washer on my deck. It's a wood deck, and I know it's very hard dense uh, Brazilian hardwood, but um, I'm not responsible when it comes to power tools, and I'm afraid that I would damage my deck with a pressure washer, so I don't use a pressure washer. That's a lot of a lot of, people, a lot of people do, and we're not here to tell you don't. Uh, we will tell you to be very careful if you do, but um, it's not necessary. It simply isn't. Certainly not on my deck, which is covered, so the majority of it is only just got dust and dirt, you know, that sort of sediment stuff that just gets on there. But uh, yeah, I would say if you want to use a pressure washer on your deck, be very careful. Start it out on the lowest pressure setting. Uh, like my pressure washer, I can rotate the nozzle. Uh, and when I push it in and out, it uh, creates a stream or a fan. You know, or if you have settings, sometimes you can swap out the nozzles to put a fan on there. But you definitely want to put on the lowest possible setting and start off as far, far away as possible from the surface and gradually move into you so you know that it's not going to create a fiber damage. It'll make it furry. And once it's furry, you've hosed it. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> uh, stream is never a good idea as a rule. You just don't want to use that, especially not when you're pressure washing. So what a weak stream. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's something we can get into. Um, Right after this break, we want to talk some more about that. Let's do it. Uh, so we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Tony and Corey, your weekend warriors. Don't go away. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show, built by Par Lumber. Hey, if you haven't already, go check out our Instagram, Facebook, YouTube channel. Uh, you can go find all of that at our website at www.homeshow.com, or you can go to par.com, that's P-A-R-R.com. Click on the Weekend Warriors link. All of our information's on there. Uh, subscribe to uh, our YouTube channel. We're actually putting this right now on YouTube, and uh, you can go check that out. Hit subscribe. We'd love to have you watch our many instructional videos that we put up there. Uh, if you ever have any questions or comments, email us. We'd love to respond to those. We actually got an email today from a listener uh, who is having, having a porch cover built, a patio cover built over his front porch, and he had some questions about the framing. So we love those kinds of questions. Keep them coming. Yeah, absolutely. So before the break, we were talking about projects. Essentially what today is, we're going to go over projects that you can still get done while it's warm out, before the, the weather hits. It's not winter yet. It's still summer. And there's still time. 
And one of the projects at Tony's house that he needs to do that he's been putting off for probably too long, a couple of years. <laughs> maybe, maybe that you long. need to strip or you don't need to strip, but you need to clean and refinish your deck. And you, you like to use a product called Penifin. Yep. Uh, but before the break, you were saying that you like to use stripper on that deck, deck stain stripper rather than the cleaner. You think it works better for you in your situation? I feel like it does. I really like the result that I get by using a uh, Penifin stripper even just as uh, even just as the the clean during the cleaning portion of the deck, it's not necessary because you're not trying to strip off a previous finish. Um, I use it because it works really good to give me a super clean deck. Um, and I put that stripper down on there and let it sit for a little bit, maybe uh, ten or twenty minutes. It depends on the weather. Now you don't want that stripper to dry on there. You want it to keep it wet, so have the hose ready to mist that and keep that wet if it's necessary. Uh, my porch is covered, so I don't have to worry about the majority of it. Doesn't uh, doesn't get direct sunlight very much. So that you makes probably, it easier on me. If you did have a deck that wasn't covered, you'd probably want to wait till uh, it wasn't direct sun hitting it. Yeah, I think so. That's a great idea, which is going to be early in the morning or later in the evening when you don't have that super hot sun beating down on it because it's going to want to dry it on there and you don't want that. Hmm. You want to keep that wet. Very good tip. And then you work with that with a stiff bristled brush, brush that uh, stripper in there or detergent or detergent, whatever you choose to use. Um, I got a phone call the other day asking me if they could use Dawn dish soap and water to clean their deck. I said, absolutely. If that's what you want to use, use that. Uh, Dawn does a good job. Uh, I like that product. It's not necessarily made for cleaning your deck, but it's not the wrong choice. So, um, so, so to some, make sure that you rinse it really well, right? Absolutely. Before you stain it, and that's actually the process when you're uh, going to put the coat of stain on when you're ready to stain it or put that penifin penetrating oil in there. You have to make sure that deck is dry. Absolutely. Right? You don't want that thing wet at all. Correct. You definitely don't. You want it to be dry. And so you will put that stripper on there, let that sit a little bit, keep it uh, moist, um, scrub that with a stiff bristled deck brush, and then rinse that off. And once you get that all rinsed off, you definitely want to let your deck dry. So if you've done that in the evening, that's going to dry all night. And then the next day you go out there, make sure that you don't have any wet spots on the deck. And, um, and then is a good opportunity to go ahead and apply your stain. So if you're using a, an oil stain not to be confused with a oil-based product right i think a lot of times people think about oil-based products and they think about oil-based paint which uh, is something that's super hard to work with and you got to use mineral spirits to clean up and that sort of a thing this oil stain like penifin sunfrog super deck these are penetrating oil stains it's more like the kind of oil that you would use if you were finishing a piece of furniture inside like mineral the house. oil like yeah it's it's an oil that soaks in like if you were treating your butcher block in your kitchen with something olive oil or or linseed oil or something like that right then uh, you just let it soak in and do its thing but what you don't want to do is you don't want to have wet spots Cooling. after you've put it on there and you don't want that to dry on there right so you will cover the choose a portion of your deck that you can work with in a timely manner. Let's say five like by five, yeah. six by six. You probably don't want to go big. Right. You want to get a 10. small section and you want to stain it. Right. And then you want to let that stain sit on there for a while and you'll see it start to dry up and soak in. And then you'll have some parts where it didn't soak in. Uh, but you want to go back over that space, over that section of deck with a, like an old T-shirt, um, something that doesn't give off little lint balls or you know that sort of thing uh because that'll stick in there and be ugly so an old t-shirt is a really good thing to use and then wipe all that back after you've stained it you've applied it with a brush or a roller uh, some people even use a sprayer but you apply that on there and you let it sit and soak in and then you go back and wipe it back so you don't have any puddles or standing wetness up on the top and you let that dry move on to your next section do it again uh, put the stain on let it sit wipe it back, move to the next section. And then once you've got that done, honestly, you'll ha it'll, every situation is different. But if you put that on and it soaked it all up, there's an opportunity for you to put some more on. 
you want to put on enough stain that your wood has soaked up as much as it can take because you want to get a really good saturation of that oil in your wood. That's how it's going to be protected. And then once you start putting stain on there and it's not soaking it up anymore, then you've gotten it. You're done. Wipe that all off. Gotten it. You've gotten to it. Making you some words up. Wipe, <laughs> wipe that all back and then, um, and then let that dry on there. And you will have a very nice finish on your wood deck. That's, that's the, the uh, procedure that I followed to do mine. And I've always had really good luck. I've never personally done it. I've, I don't have anything hard wood that I would need to use that on. But uh, I have had situations where customers has, have called me and said, hey, this stuff is pooling up. And they didn't follow the procedures correctly. And they've let that that kind of wetness dry on there. And it turns into like a jelly. Yeah. And it's really sticky and it never dries. Everything floating through the air sticks to it. And then you end up with all these little hairy spots all over it. It's not it's yeah, not you, a good situation. You, you walk don't in it, want, it sticks to your shoes. Yeah. You don't want that to happen because if that happens, then you have to strip it and start over. Right. Because I, it won't dry. I got a phone call just the other day from a customer asking me if the the penetrating oil stains that we sold needed to be wiped back. And I said, absolutely. And they said, well, I want a product that doesn't have to be wiped again or wiped back. And I thought, well, I mean, I, I, there might be a product out there that says you don't have to wipe it back. It could be, but I wouldn't do it because I wouldn't want to be leaving that residue on the top of the deck, especially when I'm going to be walking on it and it could potentially be sticking to my shoes and tracking through my house. So yeah. it's a good practice to wipe it back, and um, and a lot of stains will will recommend putting on a second coat, uh, especially if you've noticed that the wood soaked up your first coat really well. So the more stain you can get that wood to soak up, the better it's going to be, the longer it's going to last, and the, the better it will perform for you. Yeah. So that's, that's a that's very a, good tip. It's a good rule of thumb. So uh, we've got, man, we've got so many other things. Here's another thing that I personally did at my home. Tony, do you have somewhere to keep your garbage cans? <laughs> you know, they sit right at the uh, right at the end of my driveway there on uh, on the sidewalk, uh, just between my house and my neighbor's house. And I mean, that's where I leave them. I don't know that it's a good spot, but that's where they are. They've been there for 12 years. So I actually built uh, a fence and I built in a place to keep my garbage cans like a privacy screen. So you can't see them. I see those periodically driving around through neighborhoods and uh, I like it. I think they look good if it's done right. Uh, you know, you could do it and have it not look good, but uh, it certainly would be better to look at something like that than looking at the garbage can sitting on the side. There's block. actually uh, neighborhoods that have HOAs that require it. You're not really? allowed to leave your garbage cans visible at all. You well, get a, you get a fine. Well, do you have in your mind a good plan and how to put something like that together? I've got some tips. I've got some ideas. I'll Let's tell see. you how I built mine. Let's talk about that right after this break. You're listening to Tony and Corey, your weekend warriors, and we will be right back. Tony and Corey here with the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show built by Par Lumber. Hey, Corey. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, have you seen our new YouTube channel? Um, of course I have. Haven't you subscribed to it yet? Uh, yeah, totally. Is that a yes or a no? Well, I don't really know how, so... Look, it's easy. All you have to do is go to www.homeshow.com and click on the YouTube link. Hit subscribe, and you're good to go. Uh, but my arms are too short. Oh, come on, it's not that hard? I think I got bit by a spider. What? Are you okay? No, yeah, I'm fine. Hey, 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 does my head look big to you? No? You don't think so? Well, whatever. Tune in this weekend. You'll definitely get a laugh, and you'll likely get some good advice, but only if you listen. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Today we're talking about summer projects that you still have time to complete before fall hits. Yeah. And uh, the first couple segments, we were talking about Tony restaining his deck, gave some really good tips on how to do it and how not to do it. Uh, but, you know, before the break, I was saying that a good project to do is to build a privacy screen for your garbage cans. And your, yeah, your garbage can and your recycle bin. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not required in my neighborhood, but you go down my street, you won't see any garbage cans. Interesting. At all. People keep them behind privacy screens or behind a fence, uh, which is kind of what I have. I built a fence and I built in an area to keep my garbage cans right behind it. And what I did was I created a double gate, essentially, that uh, one catches on the other. And I have like a cane hook that goes into the ground. And I built it uh, solid so you can't see through it. It's, it's a really nice, well, you've seen it. Sure, absolutely. I keep my garbage cans right there. But one tip I want to give you when you're building a privacy screen is to either A, make it uh, like an L shape. I've seen that where you make like a, a front and a side and then your garbage cans go in and around back. Or if you're building a gate like I did to make sure that the gate is wide enough that you can get your cans through it. Because most garbage cans are pretty wide. At least mine are. Mine are probably, you know, 36 plus inches wide. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a gate, at least a three foot wide gate, it'd be really tough to get stuff through there. So so you said, is it? are you talking about building one that's fully enclosed, four sides, and the gate allows you access to put your cans in and out? That's a way to do it, yeah. Or a... a easier way to do it is just to build a two-sided like an l shape so say coming off the corner of your garage it would come out say four or five feet turn back in towards your backyard and go back about three feet well i think a lot of the ones that i see are screens that are built right at the street side right at the street level uh down towards the end of your property closer to the street. They want, a lot of people don't want to have to drag their cans from the house to the street and back again um, every week. So what they want to do is they want to put them at the street. But like you're saying, HOAs a lot of times will say, your cans can't be visible, which means they can't be at the street. But if you were building a privacy screen for your cans at the street level, right there at the end of your driveway or whatever, um, would it need to be four sides or could it be three sides? Sure, three sides would be fine. If you were doing that, I don't see the point in that because now you're walking your garbage all the way out to the end of your driveway. I mean, if you got a long driveway, that's weird. At least your garbage cans, at least in our area, are on wheels. Mm -hmm. Are yours on wheels? Do you, you Did they come by with those? <laughs> you know, it's funny. My, my garbage cans are on wheels, but when I put the garbage out to be picked up by the garbage company, um, it's generally late at night. And so I don't want to make that noise. So I just pick it up and carry it anyways. <laughs> uh, but I do keep my cans at the end of the driveway right near the street. And so when I set the cans out, all I do is just move them three or four feet, um, onto the street side, onto the edge of the street where they can be grabbed easily. And well, I'll tell you back. what, it le it's, that's better than the alternative, which is the reason you would even do this is if you were keeping your cans inside the garage. That is one place that you never want to keep your garbage cans, because if you do that, you're inviting rodents and pests yep. to yep. come into your garage and get into your garbage. Right. You definitely don't want to do that. Matt White with the Killers has told us several times a lot of rat problems are caused by people leaving their garbage cans in their garage. So build a nice little privacy screen. And keep them outside. And so this screen is going to be just not to harp on it, but it's going to essentially by be like building a small fence, um, four or five feet tall, um, two or three sides, and um, and I guess that's not necessarily to not necessary to enclose it. It just is to hide the cans yeah. from three sides. So and really, it only needs to be about it. five feet tall. Right. You know, that's really all you need. And if you're worried, say you have all concrete and you don't want to punch a hole through your concrete to bury posts or anything like that, you don't need to bury the posts. Like you said, if you build it three sided, it's going to stay, it's going to be sturdy enough to just stand on its own. I would use pressure treated wood since it's sitting on the concrete, but you could build it out of cedar. You could build it out of pressure treated wood. You could even uh, side it with T111 and paint it. I've seen that before too. Uh, if you wanted to put a small roof on it to keep your cans dry, I mean, I like the idea of keeping my cans dry because when they get wet, the water gets inside. It just kind of turns yucky, even mushier. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really good idea. I feel like that's uh, something that's probably on my list of things I, to do. I'd like to have something. It's a good that, little that summer hides, project. Yeah, that hides my cans. I, they are ugly. So it's 
Something I would do. Nobody wants to look at your cans. (laughs) Here's something else, Corey, that's on my list of things. A wood bench in my yard. Really? Yeah, I've got some block seating that we built out of uh, landscape stones, right? And those are okay, but... Um, I think it would be nice to build a bench, a fixed bench in the backyard that um, that stays out there, you know, something that uh, looks pretty cool. But I don't really have a good plan to put it together. I was actually going to talk to you, see if you had a plan for building a wood bench. You know, what's a cool idea, and I've seen this several times, is people take two by six cedar decking, tight knot cedar decking, and then... You stack them together, uh, almost like a bowling lane, right? And then you separate them and create spacers out of the two by six. So two by six, uh, so you'd have a six inch by six inch square block. So then you would have full board, spacer, full board, spacer, full board, spacer. Interesting. And then you'd have those spacers every three feet down the length of your bench. And then put your four by fours in there. Or even I've seen it where they've done the same thing with two by six perpendicular. So you, instead of a spacer at the ends of the, the bench, you'd have a two by six that goes perpendicular down to the ground. Of course, so those course, are only yeah. like, you know, 20 inches tall or 24 inches tall. Seems like a super easy thing to do. It doesn't have a back on it. Right. But um, but super easy thing to do. That's a really good idea. I like the idea of having some seating out in the yard, something that looks like it belongs there, but not something that it looks like I went and bought from Fred Myers or Costco. Right. So that's something I look forward to doing also in my yard. Yeah. You know, and then you could seal it with penifin. Yes, make absolutely. It, make it look really nice. I'm really good at that. You know, I had a uh, an old bench in our old backyard that was concrete. It was one of those old style. Sure. Uh, kind of had the Corinthian look at the bottom, you know, with the big uh, shapes, round shapes and all that stuff. It looked really cool. And we left it at the old house. Oh, and I really miss that thing. Because it was 750 pounds it, and impossible it to move. Ton. Yeah. But I did like having it. Uh, well, I'm going to just go right ahead right now and say thank you for leaving that <laughs> so that I didn't have to help you move it to the new place. That's great. Yes. Uh, what else you got on the list there, Corey? You know, one of one of the projects that I would love to get done this year, so it's ready for next year, is to build a small greenhouse. We actually came up with this idea, our producer buddy came up with this idea, to build a miniature greenhouse. So you have a, essentially a garden box, double tall. So it'd be a, a about two feet tall, 20 inches or so. And you cut an angle in the top. So then you get maybe some sun tough, some polycarbonate roofing, put some hinges on it and create a little greenhouse that you could plant all your starters in or some herbs and start that season in the spring before you know the growing season when you can actually start doing it in a greenhouse. We don't have room for a big one, right? But something like that, like a small one would be perfect. That is a really good idea. I kind of actually am imagining an old, maybe a reclaimed sort of um, window pane, maybe that's got some some grids in it and it's got a wood frame. So it'd be easy to, to hinge on to the top of that, that and with a little handle at the bottom that you can lift it up, maybe some, uh, some sticks to hold it up when you want to have it open uh, while you're working in there. That's a great idea. I like that idea. A mini greenhouse for the backyard. We should That's do a good. video about that. Oh, we absolutely Let's should. That is a super great idea, and I think I'm going to take you up on that one, too. I want to have one of those. Uh, we got some more items on our list, so don't go away. You're listening to Tony and Corey, your Weekend Warriors. We'll be right back. Tony and Corey, your Weekend Warriors, with a great quick tip for you. Corey and I are here building this uh, mobile collapsible workbench, and we were just cutting two by four, inch and a half thick, with his circular saw. Most circular saws come with an adjustable depth cut, and you need to have an inch and a half or two inches to cut through two by four, but we're moving now to three quarters of an inch plywood, and we wanna shallow up the depth of that cut so that that blade is not hanging out there when we're cutting something, potentially interacting with something that's underneath the surface that we're working with. It can be dangerous, and this is a safety measure that you should use every opportunity you get. Thanks for tuning in, folks. We'll catch you next time. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Thanks for staying with us. Today, we're talking about projects that you can still start and get done during the summer. Summer's almost over, and uh, now's the time. 
You still have time. Still have time. So get out there. Right before we went to the break, you were talking about a mini greenhouse, which inspired a thought in my mind. Um, I have said this so many times on the show. I really love spring flowers. Spring flowers, Corey, oftentimes come from bulbs. And the bulbs are planted in the ground, and then the spring flowers come up really early. They're the first things to come up in the year, and then they go away quickly. But it's a, it's a really awesome early start to spring when the when the spring flowers start coming up from their bulbs. But the time to, to plant bulbs, I believe, is now. So may, maybe as you're going into fall, but I think since you were talking about that little greenhouse, it made me think, now's the time to go out and find some open spots in your flower beds, in your front or backyard that look like it could use something and plant some bulbs in there so that you can have some spring flowers that come up really early before you even start thinking about mowing your lawn or weeding in your yard or doing anything landscape related outside. Before you even start that in the spring, you've already got these flowers that bloom early all by themselves. You didn't have to go to the store and buy anything. They just came right up and said, hi, <laughs> winter's over. It's beautiful. And I, I love that. that. I love, I have bulbs all over the place. I absolutely love it. When I come home in the, in the early spring and see that those flowers have already bloomed in my front yard, I just absolutely love it. It just brings a smile to my face every yeah. single day. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. This is, but this is the time. Get them in the ground now. You won't see anything until spring, but get them in the ground You'll absolutely, absolutely benefit from that. Here's another outdoor project that is fun, that I feel like you can still get done now and enjoy it, is a fire pit. Oh, yeah. When was the last time? Well, you've built a fire pit. I did. Yeah, I did. I love my fire pit. I I built a, a pretty big one, really. Um, well, as far as the fire pit itself goes, it's four by four. But, um, but I, I laid a paver patio with uh, with block bench seating all the way around it and a fire pit right in the middle and it serves me very very well i absolutely love my fire pit i use it every opportunity i get yeah and it's uh, not cold and you know it's not that cold at night that you you know can't not use it oh certainly not now as a matter of fact now it's is now is very warm still at night um but um at least in the pacific northwest so uh, you, it's getting used a lot right now, and you can use it, you know, through October into November before it starts to just get super cold and you nice. don't want to be out there. But I absolutely love my fire pit. It's not expensive. Very easy to do. And you can actually go out and buy a fire pit. You can buy a, a fire pit kit that's got blocks that go around in a circle with a, a steel or iron um, ring that goes on the inside. You can get one that holds a grill if, uh, if you want to grill on it outside, but um, a fire pit is a good way to go. Just want to make sure that you follow some, uh, some very simple rules, right? Don't use rocks around the fire pit that are not intended to be yeah. get, get hot. There are some rocks, you know, that you don't want to use river rocks. You don't want to use around there. Um, so, you know, use fire bricks or blocks that are intended to be used for a fire pit. And um, and you can have something great for a long time. I yeah, love a lot my of fire people pit. don't know this, that you shouldn't use fire or uh, river rocks around a fire pit. Absolutely. But the apparently the water that gets inside of them creates steam and they will actually explode. Yeah. Those river rocks can explode. Yeah. There so. are rocks that are intended for that use and rocks that are not. So make sure you know that. But building a fire pit is a great summer project. Totally. Uh, going along with the fire pit, a good project to build right now is a woodshed. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I've got wood stacked right out in the open. And I think to myself that I stacked that there so that it would get good and seasoned. And then it gets rained on all winter long. And uh, I think that I want to go over and burn some of it and it's wet. So um, that's a really good idea. An open sort of um, three sided maybe woodshed, but something that just covers it from the top so that it's not constantly getting drenched during the rainy season. And uh, I think that's a great idea. That's something I definitely want to do. I, I've got a great spot for it. I just haven't, I haven't prioritized it, I guess. Yeah. You know, it's kind of the same sort of situation that if you don't want to bury the posts, you don't have to, you know, you can build a freestanding uh, woodshed. You just build four posts, connect the bottom and the top. 
So with, uh, say, two by fours or two by sixes, and you can even build it sing as a single uh, piece, and then the top, just build one side lower and create a shed roof. Shed roof, yeah. You can order, you can go to any par lumber and order metal roofing. Metal roofing is, for a three-foot piece, it's like under $2 a linear foot. So if you've got a two-foot by 12-foot woodshed that you want to build, two feet deep, maybe a little bit for overhangs. I mean, so you're talking under $20, $30 for a piece. I would say one foot by three foot for a 29-gauge you know, standard oh, profile yeah. metal. It's probably about three fifty, three dollars and fifty cents a foot. Probably you could say right. okay. you could you could almost safely say a dollar ish per square foot. Um, you'd be looking at, and and then of course you've got some incidentals, some screws, you know, yeah. to put it down with. But, but you're you right, put, it's not you expensive. Buy that roofing for thirty, forty bucks. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Rather than trying to put down plywood, you know put down shingles. I mean, that's just kind of a pain in the butt. You can get it done with metal roofing. Yeah. I built a patio cover, uh, or I'm sorry, a barbecue cover uh, out on my patio, and it's freestanding, but I've uh, braced it up in all directions, so it's pretty sturdy. And I use metal for the roof. Yeah. And it works fantastic. It's a perfect example of the exact same kind of structure you'd want to do for your wood. Yours is maybe a little tall. Uh, for wood, you might lower that down a little bit. Totally. Um, but yeah, it's uh, six, seven feet tall versus yep. a, wo- a, you know, wood shed. You could build yeah, four feet if, tall. If, if you can, would you be using one four by four at each side or two four by fours at each side? How, how deep are you thinking? A foot or two feet deep? Or are you just thinking one four by four at each side with a beam between them and shed roofing on the top? You're thinking four posts. Yeah, four posts. So you keep those four posts tight together and you can use them to stack the wood up against and get a nice, you know, maybe a cord sized, one cord of wood sized uh, wood shed, I would say. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> one is, thing I is would about s- the perfect size. One thing I would say is to make sure that it's elevated off the ground. You just don't want that wood sitting on the ground because that moisture is going to wick up and it's just going to ruin all that firewood. And so you're putting down there like maybe some kind of pallet material or something down on the on the bottom that you stack your wood yeah, on? Yeah, just or rails or stickers, you know, mm-hmm. just to keep it up off the ground. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, good, yeah. good. That's a great idea. Yeah, I like that. Um, I, I would like to have a woodshed on my property. Well, maybe we'll build you one. I think that would be nice. Here's something that maybe won't be on my property. But I'm sure a lot of people out there are thinking about it. I know it was on your list of things to get done, which you still have not done. I know. But you have been thinking about it for a long time. A swing set, a very simple A-frame swing set. I have built one in the past, and uh, it was a fun project, very fun project. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. It, uh, my kids are grown and gone now, so no swing set at my house. But uh, But I know you're working on it. Yeah, we actually decided to buy a trampoline instead. Oh, that's safer. Yeah, good yeah, job. You know, we were going to build one out, but, you know, the kids, it's got it's got sides on it. It's safe. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we talked to a lot of people, and we were just trying to decide, and we, we let the kids decide, and they chose the trampoline, which is great for me because I didn't have to build a swing set. <laughs> but... It is, like you said, it's a pretty easy project. It really is a pretty easy project. A frame, if you're using four by fours or four by six, I used four by sixes when I did mine. And um, I had two four by sixes at an angle and I had them in the ground. I put them in the ground. I didn't want to. I didn't want to compromise, you know, the integrity of it all. I put them in the ground and and brought them together at the top and through bolted um, through the four by six legs right through the top four by eight beam that I had. And I uh, hung my two swings right from that four by eight beam. And I'll tell you what, that thing was solid. Didn't rock. I got on it. I think I might have stretched out some of the uh, links on the chain, but I, but the wood structure itself was not compromised. It didn't collapse when you got on it? <laughs> no, it did not, <laughs> which was uh, which is great. But building a swing set is a, is a great summer project, and it's not too late. Yeah. No, that's a great idea. Uh, here's another one. Build a retaining wall. If you're in your backyard... And you've been looking at that big open area with that, you know, big sloped area that you want to take care of. Can't know what to do with it. Yeah. Now's a good time to do it. Yeah. It's not in the dead of summer, but it's still dry and it's still warm enough. 
to get a nice retaining wall built. You and I have lots of feet of retaining wall on our property. We, we have a really good uh, understanding of how important and helpful a retaining wall on your property Just can be. Just don't forget the drainage. That's right. Hey, we gotta take another quick break. When we come back, more list of things you can do still this summer. Don't go away, you're listening to Tony and Corey. We'll be right back. Show built by Par Lumber. When it comes to big or small projects around the home, Tony and Corey have got the know how and the answers to make your life just a bit easier. Now, here's Tony and Corey. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show built by Par Lumber. I'm Corey Valdez. I'm Tony Cookston. Thanks for tuning in with us. Staying, staying tuning, staying Stun, tuned. Stunini. Thanks for being here. Today we're talking about summer projects that you still have time to get done uh, while you still have the daylight and the warmth to do them. Absolutely. Uh, Real quick, I wanted to say, if you haven't already, go check out our YouTube, uh, Facebook, and our Instagram. We're at WW Home Show. And Pinterest. uh, And Pinterest. Go to our website. It's WWHomeShow.com. Or you can go to Par.com. That's P-A-R-R.com. Click on the Weekend Warriors link, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. You can email us at weekendwarriors at par.com. Weekendwarriors at par.com. Easy as that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I tell you, we're talking about projects that you can still get done. Don't be afraid. Before we went to the break, we were talking, we we had just touched on retaining wall. Uh, A retaining wall does not have to be super difficult to make. Um, But there are some things to keep in mind. If your retaining wall crests up over 48 inches, then you're reaching an area where it needs to be engineered. Um, you need to have somebody tell you that it's going to be strong enough to hold back the amount of dirt uh, that's pushing up against it. So there are some things that surround that if you're building a big retaining wall. But if you're building something small in your yard, two feet tall or smaller, that's tearing uh, an otherwise slope that is difficult to do something with, then that's something that can be very easy and it's not really very expensive actually blocks maybe that are 12 or 16 inches wide 12 inches deep 8 or 10 or 12 inches tall uh, these blocks uh, are somewhere around three dollars a piece probably and the really the most important thing is getting the ground that you're going to put the, bl- the the block on level yeah uh, you, and you then, want your first course to be as level as it can be and that first course is typically underground you can be yeah it depends on your slope and how much you're doing sure, sure, right sure. um and, and there's a couple of things to consider what you want your wall to look like when it's done if you're if you're building a wall left to right in front of you and you're looking at it and the ground slopes down or up from left to right then you need to consider if you want your blocks to follow the slope of the ground or if you want them to be level straight across. Some people just want to put up a little wall and they don't care that it's level. But if you want it to be level and the the ground is sloping away from you to the right, <clears throat> then your first block's going to be lower and the blocks over to the right will be higher up on top of the ground. So you'll have to dig down to start that first course. And uh, we've determined that a two-foot level, not enough to get that done. Yeah, that is not. You're correct. Uh, you'll need to have a four foot level probably in order to get that done or even a six foot level to get that done in order to be uh, super careful to make sure that you get a really flat first course. Yeah. And I do want to say that don't be afraid to use a, uh, a string, a mason line. That's the word I was thinking of. Don't be afraid to use a mason line. And if you don't know what that is, essentially what you do is uh, you set your line down So your first course is going to be X amount off the ground. You set your first block and then you go down to the way other end where you want your your thing out there and you throw a a line level on the string and you put a stake in the ground and you wrap it around there and you make that string perfectly level. And then your first course just runs right along that level string and it works out really, really well. Yeah, that's a that's a great tip. And ha- having your wall run level with the ground um, level, even though your ground is not going to be level, that's 
very pleasing to the eye. And even though it's easier to just lay the block on top of the ground and stack them up and to push your dirt up against, when you're looking at that later, it, you'll be unhappy with it. Yeah. Uh, I've been there for sure. Um, but you want to put down some gravel uh, below your first course probably. Um, it allows for drainage, which is really good. Make sure that um, if your wall is coming up, around the higher side, around four foot, even if you're keeping it down low enough that it doesn't have to be engineered, you get up around three or four feet tall and you probably want to put a drain pipe behind that wall so that water won't build up behind the wall and cause a problem for you. Yeah. Hydraulic or hydrostatic pressure. Yeah, that's right. So, but apart from those simple rules about building a retaining wall, you can really use retaining wall blocks to accent your landscaping and it can be functional and beautiful both at the same time yeah they call that hardscaping yeah i absolutely love it i've got i've got a couple of hundred feet of retaining wall in different places around my property and uh, and you, I, you do as well i had about a hundred square linear feet of retaining wall or more probably had about 150 and i ripped it all out and put new stuff in different places yeah yeah but took but, the retaining wall out worked we, good we, we flattened everything out but then we put a lot of uh patio blocks in, but I did have to put one long retaining wall on the one side to fend back the neighbor's yard. Right, because he's his elevation is higher than yours is. Quite a bit mine, yeah. And, and in, in order for you to to um, to make that all work for your your ground where your level is, you had to put a retaining wall in to hold that back. And it looks great. It, done properly, it looks absolutely great. Yeah, it does look good. But it's not too late to do that this summer. Absolutely. So what are some other outdoor projects, Tone? Well, I'll tell you what. I had um, built a split rail fence on the front of my property that bordered my property and the street. So when you came down the street towards my house, the first thing that you would see was this split rail fence. Well, I decided that I didn't want to have that split rail fence separating my property from the street anymore. And so I pulled it down. But, you know, I repurposed it and put that split rail fence around my garden. Ooh. And now I love it so much more. Before, I felt like it was a functional thing there that uh, didn't really do much for me, even though I was trying to keep kids from running on the off the street and jumping down into my yard, and so I put that fence up there. But um, as, as years went by, I realized it wasn't doing there what I needed it to do, and it looked a lot better around my garden. Now it's not functional, necessarily around my garden but it sure looks really good back there but that's a pretty simple project that anybody can do i mean you don't have to be a fence builder to be able to do a retaining wall or a split rail and by split rail you kind of mean that's kind of the farm style looking fence right there's there's posts uh, cedar posts with holes drilled through them am i right there that's absolutely right and then you have are there different types of posts, right? There's end posts and corner posts. And line posts. So end posts, line posts, and corner posts. What is the difference between those three? Yeah, an inline post is a post that would be in a long straight run, right? And your your rails will be eight or ten feet long. So every eight or ten feet, you have another post. And if you're continuing your fence along, then you have a hole that goes all the way through that post, actually two. If it's a two rail fence or a three rail fence, if you three, of course, you'd have three holes, but the hole goes all the way through the post so that your rails can fit into each side of that post in an inline post. A corner post will have holes in one side and then on the 90 degrees from that side of the post, there will be two holes so that you can turn the corner. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, an end post only has two holes in one side, and it's solid all the way around, and that it gives you your finish there. we got to take another quick break. I can't believe it already. we got some more projects for your summer. Don't go away. You're listening to Tony and Corey. We'll be right back. Hey everybody, here's a quick tip for you when you're using extension cords. If you have to plug in one of your tools, uh, a good thing to do is to tie the ends around like that and plug them in. So that way, if you're working with your tool and you get to the end of your extension cord, it just doesn't unplug or if it gets caught on something. So that'll help you uh, stay more productive. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors. Thanks for staying with us. Today we're talking about summer projects that you still have time to finish. 
Tony, uh, we talked about, Tony and I, we talked about uh, split rail fence during the last segment. That's mm-hmm. something that uh, anybody can do. Yeah, it doesn't, the posts don't need to be concreted in the ground. Uh, you know, those things, uh, there's no wind resistance to these because it's just a two rail or three rail fence. So the wind will go right through it. So it's not pushed on regularly by the wind. And so it doesn't get a lot of that stress on it. So the posts don't need to be concreted in the ground. You just kind of want them to be plumb. Right. And you want them to be in line with each other. Exactly. That's exactly right. And I, I recommend putting some gravel down in the hole before you drop your post down in there for drainage. Uh, yeah. That gives, uh, keeps it from sitting in water all the time, just cause it to rot sooner. But, uh, but they are, it's made out of cedar. So it's got those natural tannins that, that protect it from the elements outside. Yeah. That's a good tip. But they're great looking fences, not expensive, easy to install, and easy to take down and move to another spot if you decide that there's another way you want to use it later. Here's a project that I really, really, really want to get done this year, and that is install landscaped lighting. Mm -hmm. I have all of the components. I have the lights, I have the wire, and I have the transformer. I just need to find the time. And I mean, now's the time to really get that done. Does the wire for that is it's low voltage, I assume. Yeah, they're low voltage LED lights. Does that wire need to be run underground or can you just set it right up on top of the ground and just run it under your bark dust? Well, they recommend that you bury it three to six inches underground. So really all you're doing is creating a channel probably with their spade shovel and just creating a little teeny trench burying it just under the surface of the ground so that way you don't chop at it with a shovel later on. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, it's that easy. Will you be able to control those lights from a switch like in the garage or are they remote control? No, I don't have a remote. You can. You absolutely can. Uh, But I have a a transformer timer combination uh, and a light photo cell photo cell that that goes on the side of it so then when it gets dark out the lights come on yeah when the light comes up they go off or you can set it to be on when the light goes out you can set them to be on for an hour or five hours or whatever you want do you find that they to do the project that you want to do with them that they were very expensive yes and no you know the most expensive part was the transformer i bought a uh, a transformer that was going to handle all of what i needed to handle which was about 30 lights. Oh, that's a yeah, lot. quite a few. So, and I wanted something a little bit nicer. So that cost me around 500 bucks just to get the transformer that I wanted with the photo cell, with the timer, uh, in a stainless steel box. Is it a continuous line between them or do you have to wire them? So no. Yeah. You run, uh, you run a wire from, from the transformer to the far end of where you're going to go. And you have to do some calculations with how many lights that you can put on that that run. Uh, but yeah, you just do the math. You find out the, the, the drain or the amps that it's pulling from each lamp. And then you add all that up and make sure that you're not going over a specific number, which is all in the instructions. So the distance between each light is predetermined? No, no, not at all. I mean, along that line, you can Kind of put them wherever you want. Is it like a plug and play thing? They've got plugs where you just plug into each light with your wire. Yeah, it's like um, the lights, the the wire. It's a they come off to like this little pigtail thing that has like a cutter on one side. So you put it over the wire that's underground, and you kind of clip it over it, and it snaps, and it makes contact with the cool. buried wire. Yeah, that's cool. And so, how did you determine how far apart you thought you? I mean, thirty lights is a lot. How big of an area is that going to cover for you? Well, that's my front yard and my backyard. Oh, wow. So I'm spanning all the way around my backyard, which is about total from end to end. I think I'm looking at about 200 feet. Can you get all 30 lights on that one transformer? I can. Yeah. Wow. Because I'm using LED. Wow. That's exciting. I feel like 30 lights on a transformer all running off of one uh, maybe photo cell, which turns it on and off with the rising and setting of the sun. That seems very low maintenance LED, which is going to last for a very long time. And uh, if that was affordable for you, then that's an exciting project. I, I'm super excited to see that happen. Yeah, I think all together, I probably got about 1200 bucks mm-hmm. into the whole project that I haven't started. 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I tell you the one thing that's drawn me back, the one thing that I need to figure out, and that is in one area, I have to go under the sidewalk. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I don't know how I'm going to do that yet. I've, I've talked to people and I've kind of worked it out. I've looked up some YouTube videos on how to do it. Uh, but with the one area is I got to go about five feet mm. under a long sidewalk. It's the entryway to my you front got a door. Bore. You got to bore underneath that thing. Exactly. So what I thought I would do is dig a hole on one side about two feet down, maybe a foot or two feet down in about two foot by two foot. And then I would take either my pressure washer or I've also in, in drill a hole using my pressure washer. I've seen people online do that, mm. uh, but I've also seen people get a long drill bit. You can buy or rent long drill bits, like four foot, five foot long, six foot long drill bits. They're on like a flexible deal mm -hmm. and use that to drill it out. And I then, haven't quite decided how I'm going to do it. Will you, hopefully you'll be drilling a hole only big enough that you can fill with a piece of pipe so that in the end you don't have a big void. If you did have a big void, if you somehow have to fill that, that, right. could, that could be challenging. Yeah. That's the only thing holding yeah. me back. I mean, I need to figure that portion well, of it out. I can see that that's, uh, that's, some, that's a serious consideration. I mean, you definitely don't want to compromise the integrity of your patio or your, your walkway or your sidewalk. Right. So that's, uh, that's super important. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, that's an exciting project. Uh, I, I look forward to being a part of that. Good. Which I'm sure I will. I hope <laughs> you sure are. <laughs> uh, here's, uh, here's an item, Corey, um, on our list that says inspect your chimney inside and out. Now, uh, we're inspecting the chimney because we know we're going to be using it when the cold weather comes. And you want to make sure that all of the soot and stuff is cleaned out from the inside. And, and that it's ready to use and that your flu works properly. You also want to make sure that you don't have missing mortar on the outside between the bricks or cracks that need to be filled um, or any sort of things on the outside that compromise. And the reason why that's important is because uh, voids in your mortar or cracks in your brick uh, through the wet season and the cold season, what happens is moisture gets inside there and it freezes and it causes those cracks to get bigger and bigger and bigger until it will compromise the integrity of your chimney. And then you could be looking at a super big bill in order to get that fixed. So fixing cracks while they're small is super important. Now, having said that, since you're doing the whole thing at one time, you're checking the outside and the inside, cleaning the inside, there's an expense there that comes with that. I saw a tip that said, we like to clean our chimney in the spring instead of in the fall. And I'll tell you why. Because everybody cleans their chimney in the fall right before they start using it. And that's a time where it can be difficult to get a chimney sweep out or they charge more money during that time because they're getting so much business during that time. And so the busier they are, the more you pay and the harder it is to get somebody in. Here's a tip, a pro tip. Get your chimney cleaned, and I know we're in the fall now, or coming towards the fall, but get your chimney cleaned in the spring before, uh, before the summer, right? When you will go a long period of time without using it. That way you can get a contractor that is not already busy, probably get cheaper prices, better rates uh, during that time, and it won't take as long to get it done. Yeah, no, that's a very good tip. But also keep in mind, uh, yeah, you have a wood burning fireplace or a or a stove or a pellet stove or something to that nature. Uh, but also if you have a gas burning fireplace, they actually need to be serviced every so often. You could pull the face off and look in there. And if there's a ton of dust or fur or dust bunnies in there, you want to get that cleaned out and serviced. So now's the time to do that or in the spring, like Tony said. All right, we got to take another quick break. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this. Car Lumber is committed to providing the best customer service. We provide personal service. We're problem solvers. We're positive and courteous. We're competent and professional. We are committed to delivering exceptional service every time. We're appreciative and we care. We are Par Lumber. 
Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors. Thanks for staying with us. Today we're talking about summer projects that you can get done before the end of summer. Right. You still have time. And uh, before the break, we were talking about getting your chimney serviced or your uh, fireplace or your gas burning fireplace place. Tony actually gave a tip saying that you should do that in the spring. That's a pretty good idea because it is difficult or it can be difficult to get somebody out to do something if everybody on the planet is trying to get that done as well. We'll need to remember to add that to our spring cleaning tips. Spring cleaning tips is the perfect time to have somebody come out and, and sweep your, your chimney. chimney. Yep. So here's another one, Tony, going right along with that. Okay. Your furnace. If you need to get your furnace serviced, don't wait until that first 40 degree night that you want to crank on your furnace and it doesn't work. Right. I mean, we've we've said this on this show so many times. You don't want to wait till the first day because that first day when 50,000 people are cranking on and, and their furnaces don't turn on, you're going to be that person that's calling them saying, I, I need this. You need to come out. Okay, well, you're going to pay a premium. Yep. And you're going to wait. And you're going to wait. So getting it either done sooner than later, if even now is fine, I would say to go out, try, turn on your furnace, make sure that it fires on, make sure that the furnace filter is clean or brand new, and just be ready. It's 95 today, so let's go over into your house and turn your furnace on and see if it's working, shall right? we? Right, right. <laughs> I mean, obviously there's some hesitation, um, but uh, maybe choose a more moderate summer day to get that done uh, when it's not super duper hot, but that is a great tip. You need to know if your furnace is working before it's already cold and you are suffering. So that's, that's a great tip. Yeah, the, uh, I've been there. I know you've been there. Furnace breaks down and it's not working. And then you call the guy and the guy's like, well, man, I can come out on Thursday, mm -hmm. you know, and it's Monday night. So you're wearing sweaters and everybody's freezing and those sorts of things. So you don't want to be in that position. Okay. Here's a really good tip. This is something that can still get done. It's not too late to get this project done. And it's something that's on my mind. Um, I will be working in the garage this week, working in the garage, organizing inside of the garage, um, uh, making sure that I have plenty of space to move around and do things. But while I'm doing that, I'm thinking about the temperature in the garage in December. And it's cold in my garage in December. And I don't ever want to go out there at all because it's so cold. Um, there are some things that I can do to prepare my garage for the super cold weather before it's already here. One of those things is inspect my garage door flashing or weather stripping, sorry, check that. Uh, inspect my garage door weather stripping. The weather stripping is uh, attached to the, the jam. Yep, yeah, uh, they call that the garage surround, right? Um, and then attach that and, and it lays right on top of the garage door. When the garage door is closed, it makes a nice seal there. That will get old and brittle and s fail and stop keeping, it will st stop keeping the wind from coming in right through that weather stripping area. If that's not performing for you, then you've got cold wind and potentially rain coming right through into your garage. If you want to cozy up your garage, make sure that your weather stripping around your garage door is functioning properly. Here's a second tip. Make sure that your garage door is also functioning the way it should. If you've got an old wood garage door. I mean, wood is not bad as far as insulating properties go, but it's not the very best thing. You can also have um, a very inexpensive single wall, what they call a single wall garage door, that is not insulated or not insulated very well. A double wall insulated garage door, which is, you know, better than, than me because you've bought one recently, mm -hmm. uh, can really add to the insulating value of your garage mm -hmm. and keep your garage so much warmer. And if it's time to replace your garage door anyways, don't go cheap on it. And maybe you don't have to replace your garage door, but maybe it's just time for an upgrade. Upgrade to a double wall insulated overhead garage door. It can really change the comfort level of the garage in the winter months. Here's the third and thing. And the summer months. And the summer months. That's right. It keeps the heat out the same way that it keeps the heat in. Here's the third thing. 
consider insulating the walls in your garage. If the garage walls are not already insulated, it can be very, very helpful to insulate the garage walls in order to keep it warmer in there in the cold months. And if you're going to take the time to insulate the walls, maybe take the time to sheetrock them too. Not a bad idea. Uh, is your garage insulated and sheetrocked all the way around? So yeah, yes and no. Uh, my garage is actually insulated with pegboard over top of the insulation on the walls and the ceiling is sheetrocked. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I would probably do differently is... And one thing that I did in my last house that I really, really loved was insulated and then sheeted the interior of the walls with OSB. Mm-hmm. Oriented strand board, plywood. It's not plywood, but a lot of people call it plywood. Sheeting. Shipboard, sheeting. Uh, it's, it looks kind of funny raw, but you can prime it and paint it, and it looks really nice. And the nice part about that is it's super durable. You can nail into it. You can hit it with, you know, the kids can hit it with baseball bats and I mean, all kinds of things. And it's not going to break like sheetrock. Yeah. And you can hang things from it and uh, it's going to give you a little bit of more Absolutely. strength than you would get from drywall. Yeah. But yeah, that's a really good tip. And it's super inexpensive. Yeah. OSB right now is really inexpensive. You can get that for seven four, bucks a sheet. Yeah. You can get that for four or five bucks less than a sheet of sheetrock. And you so, don't have to use any sheetrock mud or tape or texture yeah all of that that's it's a great that's a great tip i think that if you didn't paint it it could be a little dark maybe sure um uh sheetrock being white uh does give you uh some extra brightness but if you're going to take the time to prime and paint it that's a it's a really good tip i like that yeah and it's nice so that's a garage tune-up that's another project you can definitely get done before it's too late you did forget one piece of weather stripping on the garage door. Oh, yeah? And Tell that's me. along the bottom oh, where it yes. meets the concrete floor. Absolutely, you're right. There is a round piece of replaceable weather stripping on the bottom of all your garage doors. So when it comes down, it smashes against the concrete and it creates a weatherproof seal underneath. And what happens to that over the years is it gets dry and brittle and it's no longer pliable. And then what happens is when your garage door is closed, it takes on that shape. And then when you open your garage door, it stays in that same shape. And yeah. it's no longer creating a good seal between the bottom of the door and the concrete floor. It sounded so, like you were describing your face. Replacing Old, that. dry, brittle, <laughs> uh, stays in the same shape. Replacing that weather stripping on the bottom of your garage door is as important as replacing the weather stripping around the sides and the top. So that's Certainly. good. That's a very good tip. Okay, what's the next one on the list? You know, same thing, you know, just maintenance, general maintenance of your house. You know, we kind of beat this horse to death when we talk about maintaining your house, but it is so important. Agreed. You know, here's a simple one that people probably overlook way too much, and that's cleaning the dryer vent uh, up from the exterior of your house to your dryer. You know, your dryer sits on the exterior wall. Yeah. No big deal. That's pretty simple to clean out. My dryer sits about... 24 feet from where it comes out of the wall and then hits the exterior wall. So I have to get in there occasionally with a super long set, this post or this uh, cleaning rod that you screw together piece after piece after piece. And they're two feet at a time. You got to put those all together with a little, you know, brush on one end and run that all the way into the, into the dryer. Cause when that lint gets stuck in there, it's, Makes the dryer super inefficient for one, mm -hmm. but it also creates a fire hazard because lint is extremely flammable. flammable yeah. And you get high, really, really, really high temps with uh, the exhaust coming out oh, of your absolutely. dryer. So there's definitely an opportunity for a fire there. And there's one more thing with the washer and dryer. Replace your hoses. They actually recommend you replace the water hoses on your washing machine every year. More from our list as soon as we get back. Don't go away. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Thanks for staying with us. Today in the show, we're talking about summer projects that you can still get done while it's warm out. And uh, we have been talking about so many different things, you know, inside and outside the garage. Uh, you know, we've 
We've got a lot more to go through, and we've only got this last segment to talk about them. Probably have to speed up here to get through these things. But here's one, Tony, that you kind of mentioned earlier in the show about fixing the cracks on your chimney. Chimney. But you also need to look at fixing cracks in your foundation. And also in your driveway and your front and back patios. Right. If you have cracks in there now, I guarantee you, by the springtime, they're going to be worse. This is something that I know all too well because this is a, a scenario that has literally taken place at my house. I had a crack in a portion of my driveway and I saw it there. It was it was a hairline crack. And, uh, you know, my first thought went to structurability and is why did that happen? And, and then I talked to professionals and they're like, oh, that happens. You know, you got a big driveway with big slabs. And uh, those things are going to tend to do that. A lot of times you end up with one vertical crack down the middle and one horizontal crack down the middle and their hairline cracks. And and uh, it is what it is. Um, but over the years, Corey, water seeps into those cracks. And when that happens and then that water freezes, of course, it separates those a little bit more and the cracks get bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, here's what happens after that. This is the, the lesson, the most important lesson that I learned. The more water that goes in through that crack, the more of the foundation underneath it, the dirt and the sand and the gravel or whatever that's underneath there that's supporting that concrete, it washes away. Mm -hmm. It creates this void underneath there because that's what water does. It undermines and it goes in there and it washes it away and creates giant holes underneath the concrete. You remember when you and I were in Astoria and we saw that hole in yes. the concrete? And we were like, hey, look at that hole right in the sidewalk. And then we've shined our light down in there. And the thing was like three feet deep. Yeah, you couldn't see the bottom. It was We were dropping rocks in there and you could barely hear them hit the bottom. This it was, was a, so deep. This was a sidewalk right on the street in downtown Astoria. And uh, and this hole in the sidewalk was so deep, it would have taken... It was a Goonie cave. Oh, man, it was amazing. It would have taken so much material to fill that hole up. Well, you don't want to get to that point. You don't want your crack to get so big that the water's just running down in there and undermining the support system underneath your concrete. You don't want that to happen. Address the crack as soon as you can get something in there to seal it up. Um, I waited too long and my situation was, I started dumping liquid concrete down into that crack thinking I was going to fill it up, you know, and get right up to the top. And it just kept going in and going in and going in and going in. And I realized I had a pretty big void underneath my driveway that really needed to be addressed. Yeah. And uh, at that point I was thinking, I have let this go way too long. And I had no idea what I was what I was gonna, what I was facing. I'd known it was something that I needed to do, but I didn't act fast enough and it caught up to me. So that's a really, really, really great tip. Fortunately for me, it's just under my driveway and not in the foundation of my yeah, home, yeah. which is even scarier yet. I'll give you a quick tip in your driveway. If you're worried about like what Tony's talking about, you can take a, a piece of two by four, you know, a four or five foot piece of two by four and walk around your driveway and tap it. And if you hit a void, you'll hear it. You will, it will sound super hollow. And especially around those cracks, if you're walking around and you hear those big voids, you know, it might be time to call a professional out to have them fix that. They, there are ways where they drill holes and they fill those voids with either foam or some other slurry, uh, but it can be fixed and it's way cheaper than replacing your driveway than replacing that slab absolutely that's a great tip so take a look around the property make sure you find those um potential cracks and uh, and get them sealed up right away if you find a crack that's large and you have a void and you don't know how to fill it and and maybe in the meantime maybe you're going to call a professional but in the meantime you can fill the crack with like uh, caulking rod, right? Or backer um, rod. Backer rod. Yeah. You can get some three eighths inch backer rod, stuff that down into that crack and then just seal over the top because at least that's going to prevent further damage. That will keep it from getting worse as you go forward in case you neglect it. Don't get it done. Can't afford to have somebody come out and do it right now. At the very least, fill that void, fill that crack and keep more water from getting in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. Uh, here's one that I'm actually going to do this year. I am going to mulch. I'm going to get some more mulch and put it in my beds all around my yard. I got it done. 
I had the company come out and spray, not spray, where they uh, they hose it in. Yeah, yeah. Blowers. It's very, very they cool. They blow it in. Yeah, it's very cool. They have a big truck, and it's got this big, long hose, and they just blow it in. I had that done in the spring, but they I ran out. I didn't order quite enough. So I'm going to take my pickup down there and just get a couple more yards and wheelbarrow it in myself. Mostly because I want to give you some tips on the bark blowing. If you have those guys come out, they hand you a piece of paper that tells you how to care for the bulk, the the bark blowing. I didn't really read it. I was like, it's mulch. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it doesn't take care. Yeah, who, Justin, you put it down and I cares? look at it. I'll rake it out, make it, make it look nice. Yeah. And it looked fantastic yeah. when they were done. But I tell you what, when that comes out, out of the stored unit inside of the truck and they blow it in, it is extremely hot. Like, I don't know how hot it is, but it burned the grass. Wow. Around every single one of my beds by four to six inches. Mm. Completely burned of the grass. Interesting. And another thing is a lot of my small uh, plants that I had planted that spring, a lot of them almost died. And then when you read the installation structures, it tells you water it down like crazy, like every day, because it stays at that temperature. Because when it's in those big piles, the mulch is sitting there and it's biodegrading. That creates a ton of heat. So make sure that you water it down. But I'm going to do it by hand here this uh, this summer. Interesting. That's, that's Before uh, the end of the summer. Yeah, I just had I just had my bark. Uh, and also put in around my property. I love it when new bark goes in. It's absolutely gorgeous. And uh, and I just had that done. So yeah, I, this is a great time to get that done. Absolutely. Here's another one, Corey. Um, and this is, uh, people do this, right? But I think they don't do it as often as they should. Cleaning the exterior of your windows, the glass in your windows. Here's the thing. You're going to have to do this again in the spring because winter has a way of growing mold and mildew and dropping nasties and stuff gets stuck and you're not going out there in the winter cleaning the exterior of your windows. Clean them now and then you will do that again in the spring uh, after the winter has had its way with the exterior surface of your windows. But you don't want them to be dirty through the winter. Well, you make a good point because moss and mildew grows on anything that it can feed on. Right. So if you have a filthy exterior door or window, you're going to have a much greater opportunity for moss and mildew to grow on that surface because there is fiber already on. Exactly. There. There's already organic material for that stuff to feed on. Right. And it's going to jump right on there and and grow there and just be a bigger problem for you in the spring. Absolutely. So this is the time to get out and clean your exterior. I've actually seen, we just saw it. You and I were out not too long ago. And we're like, hey, look at that guy's cleaning the outside of his windows. He was on it. He didn't have anything else to do, apparently. But, <laughs> but he, uh, he sure was getting it done, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Here's another one. And one that I need to do myself. Uh, I had to do this last year. We had our roof leak. Our brand new roof, it's only five years old. It leaked. And I had a roofer come out. And he said, man, everything is beautiful. This is a very nice roof. However, I had a vent, an attic vent that came out right over my kitchen. And what had happened was there were pine needles and debris that just got clogged around that vent a little bit. And it was enough that we had a super... Heavy. heavy rain, mm -hmm. and that water hit that debris, backed up, and then went right inside that vent and right through my sheetrock and my ceiling. Can you believe that? I mean, it seemed, when you explained it to me, uh, it seemed unlikely, but uh, it does make sense to me that water, they create a channel for that water that's coming down from the peak of the mm -hmm. roof. It reaches that channel. That channel diverts the water where it's supposed to go into your gutter, and then it's gone. And then when that channel fills up with debris and the water can't get into the channel, it just runs right over the top, which is exactly what happens in your gutter. The exact same thing. Debris gets in there. The water can't get out because of the debris. And so it runs right over the top and spills right onto your yep. sidewalk. So it's something to keep in mind. Take a look at your roof. 
get it cleaned off. If there's debris, clean it up. All right, it's all the time we got. Thanks so much for tuning in, folks. This has been another episode of Your Weekend Warriors right here. The Weekend Warriors Radio Network. Have a great week.